Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Crypto Caniverse, an international faith-based show for entrepreneurs within the five C's, Christ, cannabis, cryptocurrency, cybersecurity, and certified public accountants. We are entrepreneurs on a mission to help find other entrepreneurs their missing puzzle pieces, hosted by Crystal Wampler, Alan Lau, and Jacob Livingood. The Crypto Caniverse show is booked through August. We are accepting, um, you can apply for a guest through like the end of September. We are actually booked the 1st of September, but if you'd like to reach out and apply, please do. Please reach out to crystal at canethics.com. Today's live show is being streamed across multiple platforms, including Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn, Discord, and now we have it on um, our new YouTube channel. And then Jacob, aren't you also live streaming ac across a couple other channels? Yeah, it's going to be uh, Instagram, TikTok, and two YouTube channels. Nice. Our network consists of business owners, Web3 launch pads, VCs, family offices, high net worth CPAs and attorneys, investors, angel vet investors, both in and out of Web3 and cannabis. Before we introduce our amazing speaker today, Alan, will you please present our Bible verse? Absolutely. Thank you, Crystal. Really appreciate everyone's time. Um, another week of Crypto Caniverse. I know it's Father's Day. I hope you guys enjoy uh, Father's Day weekend with your, with your fathers. Thank you, Kurt Phillips, for joining us. Today's Bible verse comes from 2 Corinthians 5-7. For we live by faith, not by sight. I love this verse because I think one of the things that, you know, in life, we go through is like we always want to see results we always want to see things that happen right away in front of us but oftentimes it's it's not what you see it's what you don't see is what is by faith it's by you know trusting in the lord and having completely faith that knowing that um he will provide the way he will be there for you he will never forget you okay he will never forget you he will never forsake you and i think that gives me um a peace of mind let's just call it Knowing that um, God is always there. He's always, always, always there. He's listening to you on a daily basis. He's uh, watching over you every step of the way. Um, knowing that there's times that you don't see is the unseen is the most important. So living by faith is really, really important. Um, so Crystal, that's that a good verse. I meditated on that verse today, um, knowing that, hey, we have to trust, we have to believe, and we know that, um, you know, he will give us, you know, he will promise us uh, the promised land and uh, we'll take you to green pastures. Thank you. You're welcome. I Thank you, Alan Lau. That, that verse is beautiful. And it just reminds me of, you know, that planting seeds and harvesting is not in the same time. So you plant your seeds and eventually they grow and then you harvest. And sometimes that takes a year. Sometimes that takes five years, but Having patience and trust in the Lord is so important. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. All righty. Now our introduction for our guest speaker, the Crypto Cannabis Show presents speaker Kirk Phillips, founder of the Crypto Bullseye Zone. Today, June 16th, 2023, Kirk Phillips, CPA, CMA, CFE, CBE, is the founder of the Crypto Bullseye.Zone the place for crypto crash courses and coaching. He's the author of the Crypto Tax Blueprint, the AICPA Blockchain Fundamentals course, Luca Library white papers, Coindesk articles, and numerous other publications. He's a member of the AICP Virtual Currency Task Force and regularly speaks and educates CPAs and attorneys about the crypto and blockchain space. He is also a BitAngels Philadelphia city leader, a DeFi deacon, and involved in numerous other projects. Welcome, Kirk. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here today. Wonderful. So we're going to open it up for questions. Um, Jacob, would you like to start? Sure, I'll start. Thank you, Kirk, for being here. And uh, thank you, Crystal and Alan, for hosting this. This is awesome and uh, allowing me to participate. And real quick, before I ask a question to touch on the uh, 
the verse. I actually meditated on it uh, two days ago. Not that verse, but uh, something very similar. I had a meet up with a couple of local entrepreneurs, and we were talking about uh, income versus or input versus output thinking and being uh, results driven or or result oriented or being um, being identity driven. So the difference between like if your room is dirty and you clean your room because it's giving you brain fog. Two weeks later, your room's going to be dirty again because you didn't change your state of being. You were walking by sight and not not faith, right? And so I really love that. And I think that's uh, recently, as of this week, I've been called to that that ideology. So I find it very synchronistic that that's what we're talking about. But anyways, to continue, Kirk, thank you for being with us. Uh, my first question is going to be, obviously, you, you came from an initial background of being in uh, uh, legal consulting as far as uh, taxation. So what what brought what was the turning point that moved you from the sort of web to financial markets and, and you you saw this whole you know crypto move and, and decided to start educating and assisting in that realm of endeavor? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess that's the uh, cl your classic uh, origin story question. So, uh, but just to, just to clarify one thing, it's not uh, really not legal. It's more uh, accounting. Just want to make that tiny little distinction there. Just because I'm not an attorney, although when it comes to tax, there is, you know, that's kind of where the legal overlap is. I guess you could say. But uh, basically, for me, like I said, I've been a CPA for a long time. So I've worked in public accounting, private, started uh, family businesses, started, started many of my own businesses. And um, so uh, really, it was one day of honor about uh, like the last week of 2013 or the first week of 2014. So right in there, uh, there was a friend that asked me, said, hey, Kirk, I want to ask you for some advice. My husband and I want to buy a computer for $1,000 and mine's a Bitcoin. Of course, I was thinking, well, what are you talking about? My highly skeptical mind was like, you know, this is not what I'm saying, but my wheels are like, you know, what are you talking about? You better go get your facts straight. That's crazy talk. And so as it turned out, I was the one who didn't know what he was talking about. And I actually went that basically from that single question changed the entire trajectory of my life at that point in time. So that's one key takeaway is pay very close attention when people are here in conversation with people. Somebody might ask you a question it could change your entire life. So basically, I went down the rabbit hole. And I said, I'll have to get back to you. And I went down the rabbit hole. I spent 2014 and 2015 writing a book. And basically, that's where it all started from at that point. So already focused on doing, let's say, accounting tax services, kind of like you know, virtual accounting services, right? Outsourced services. And really, it just morphed into a niche business. It just, it just focused on uh, businesses and the crypto digital asset space, individuals as well. And it just kind of morphed into that over time. But that's, that's kind of the quickie summary of how that happened. I love that. And then another follow up question, sort of, uh, uh, it's honestly before 101, but say I'm a, I'm an 18 to 28 year old and, uh, you know, I've got myself a standard job. I've, I've heard this buzzword a few times, crypto, blockchain. Uh, why, why, if I'm someone who maybe has dabbled a little bit in stocks, uh, just a little bit and uh, haven't really sort of touched onto this, why should I care? Why should I be looking in this in this side of of the financial markets of you know DeFi and and all this stuff? Why should I I take my time to educate on this and uh, and, and like basically what why is this something that's relevant to me as someone who's who's not necessarily involved in yeah. investing? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so, you know, I would say that uh, that makes me think of a Chris Dixon quote. You know, it's kind of legendary uh, VC investor. Uh, and he said that uh, we've moved through three phases of money, which is first we had commodity money, which is, you know, think about it from thousands to thousands of years ago. We just traded stuff, clam shells, whatever, fruits and vegetables and baskets, any kind of goods there were, right? We traded and bartered. And then at some point in the last several hundred years, we moved into politically based money, which is central bank, basically central bank. The central, the central banking model, right? Sky, sky yeah. money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's what we moved into in the last several hundred years. And now we've moved from politically based money to math based money. And that's how I like to think about it. So it's like, so when you like from that context, it's kind of like context. That's like, wow. Okay. Like, hmm, you can see how um, you see that they're, you know, from the politically based money, it seems to be like, you know, lack of fairness in there. Right. Just in, we're just talking about a couple of words, but math based money is, you know, it's objective. It's, you know, provable. It's all those type of things. So um, 
that's 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 one thought that comes to mind but it's uh there's so many things that you could dive into around that it's uh uh i think it's it really has to do with this fairness and inclusivity and stuff like that um that you know just from a banking perspective which you could also extrapolate into the you know just a little bit wider into just investments and stuff like that it's really, it's really the same stuff but we've got several billion people on the planet that don't have access to this stuff they're unbanked and so some people have heard that narrative, but that's a good one worth repeating. And so unbanked also means, you know, like I said, more broadly speaking, no access to not just banking, but other types of investments and security, stuff like that. You're literally like off the grid. So now you have the possibility that everybody can be involved here in a way that's using just a new, amazing, awesome technology. And if you want, if you really want to find out, like, also if we're talking about young people, it's like, okay, well, go try to access the, the legacy banking system see where you have friction and then use this. And that's why I think we're going to have a whole wave of a generation that's going like, wow, this is like amazing. This is like, there's such a lack of a friction. I mean, I even have a couple sons right now. One of them, he's trying, he's attempting to tap into the legacy banking model right now. And he's running into roadblocks. And, um, and I was highlighting to him how he's uh, helping and he's actually on payroll. And so there was one day where he got paid and then there was a three day weekend. And I was like, okay, so see how, you got paid. Now, by the time you, this money actually lands in your account and you can actually use it, we're talking five days later or six days later, okay? Now, me, the, what, what we do, though, is we use the three-jar system, by the way, which is like save, spend, share, except we've modified it a little bit because it's like you have to put more in save or invest than the other two. So basically, we do split payroll in half. The save piece starts off as a stable coin because that's the entry point into the crypto universe. And then from stable coins, you can invest in other stuff. So here he, he's like sitting right next to me. I'm like, okay, bam. We're talking 15 seconds on the Ethereum network. There it is. I mean, it's just when you experience it like that, it's like, it's amazing. I was like, by the way, I think we calculated to that as the like 28,000 times faster than the, than the fiat banking piece that he's going to get five days later, that 15 seconds, some, some, somewhere along those lines, right? So when you experience it that way, you're really like blown away and there is no age limit. Like, you know, it's like, how can the most important thing, one of the most important things in life, which is the financial system, uh, having, uh, you know, business acumen, finance acumen, how to operate yourself, you know, operate your, your budget on the, you know, your household budget and everything like that. Um, how can something that's possibly the most important thing be something that's typically not been taught in schools? Now, although that's changing a lot, but it's typically been absent from schools and it's like, okay, well now you're 18 you know, ready to go off into life. Okay. Now, now you're old enough to go deep. That's like, you can drive a car before you can like access the financial system in some cases. It's like, it's ridiculous. But now when you're five, you can start using crypto. I love that. And then a follow-up question, um, again, for the same sort of target demographic, right? Uh, you know, I, I just started getting into investing. Uh, I'm just starting to learn, you know, short positions, long positions and understanding dividends. And now I'm I'm being thrown this whole new slew of, you know, vocabulary words, blockchain and uh, decentralized ledgers and, you know, all this crazy stuff um, ad addressing the fear. So Crypto Bullseye, um, you, you have an educational platform to go from zero to hero for, for people that are interested in sort of dipping their toe in the water and getting involved in these ecosystems from a level of, I have no technical understanding to... I'm starting to grab the grab the ropes on this too. I can start. I could sit down at a coffee shop and educate someone else about this because I understand this. Uh, how, how do you? What's the? Uh, what, not not the. It's not necessarily a great word, but the shill um, to to convince people to you know get over that fear barrier and, and jump off the cliff. What's the? Uh, what's the dialogue? Yeah, well, I guess I guess is I guess I guess the question like uh, what's the shill around uh, actually should I get in or not get in or I want to get in but how do I get in I guess that's you know the, the, slightly different thing. Yeah, the the dialed in question would be I'm scared with the information overwhelm of all these new technical terms and this whole new system that functions completely different than what I've been uh, educated on and grown to understand. So what? How do I? Uh, go yeah. from zero to hero when when yeah. I don't even know what I'm looking at. Yeah, that's a, you know that's a fantastic question because what I found over the years is that uh, what I boiled it down to is I think it comes down to people are like asking where do I start and who do I trust. There are two basic questions there, and so around that 
it's like a, being a CPA, you know, like the research, it's AICP, AICPA research, but basically year in and year out shows that CPAs, and I'm saying CPAs slash chartered accountants, you know, the same gold standard uh, around the world, but, um, you know, that basically that category of professional is the most trusted professional of all professionals year in and year out. Now, it might be slightly more than whatever is the next on the list and this and that, but basically there's a high level of trust. So like, for example, if, if somebody is meeting someone who's a CPA for the first time, never met them before, there's our, the, the trust plateau is like already higher than it would be with somebody else simply because you got that baked in. And so, I mean, personally, that's what I'm doing is exploiting that because it's like, wow, in a world, in the world of like, where do I start and who do I trust? And there's so many people out there. Well, you know, I've got, you know, I've been in the space for 10 years probably like 20,000 hours or more experience. This is all I do is, you know, 24 seven, I got to live, eat and breathe crypto. So it's like, let's exploit that. You can go to a place that you can trust. And then you got that box checked. And then it's like, well, where do I start? And it's just kind of building little by little by little. There's nothing here that's actually, I mean, in, 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 in totality, if you're facing it from time zero, it's like, wow, this is intimidating. I want to be an expert too, if that's somebody, what somebody wanted, but it's just like one step at a time. Well, let's start with the most, the right thing first, the first things first, and then, you know, just keep building little by little by little, and you can build up to be an expert. It can be done, actually, I think, quickly, and uh, to some degree, easily, uh, if you just got the right person that's teaching you how to do it. But, a you know, a lot of it starts with security and having your fundamentals in place. That's the, that's the key thing. So people just want to jump in. They hear about returns and they hear about this and that. They just want to like jump to the end of the game. No, it doesn't work that way because you might jump in. It's kind of like the turtle, tortoise in the hare story is really what it's like. So you have somebody that might jump in. That might be the hare that jumps out and all of a sudden maybe they got in at the right time of the market. And then all of a sudden they can go bragging about, you know, maybe some killer returns they got or something like that. But eventually they're going to run out of gas, step into quicksand versus the, the tortoise, step by step, methodically building up and they will, that's how you're going to be successful in the long run. If you take the tortoise path. Slow yeah, and steady. So slow and effectively, steady. slow and steady. I love that, Alan. So effectively, yeah. you don't need to be, you don't need to be a subject matter expert to buy $5 of Bitcoin. You don't need to, to, to be uh, absolutely proficient in understanding, you know, all these different things, what an LP, LP is or an AMM is in order to create a decentralized wallet, right? It starts, starts at a uh, level one and, and uh and take it one step at a time that's it I love Le that. level one level one is just get in the game that's what yeah. it comes down to get in the game yeah um talk about uh what, what is bit angels a bit angels is actually the original uh angel investor network in the blockchain and crypto space that goes back to 2013. uh it was started by um michael turpin and david johnson david johnson's the, the person that created johnson's law anybody familiar with that you'd be a that'd be a great trivia question johnson's law is um everything that can be decentralized will be decentralized but nonetheless uh it's just michael turp uh david's no longer with the group but it was really just a way to bring projects together with investors it's a kind of a loose uh uh organization that's not it's not a formal organization it's not like a pay-to-play type of thing so what we do is as a city leader try to bring basically just be a connector, really, between projects that are developing and investors or other types of resources in the space and just bring those projects together. So I like it because it's not a pay to play model, so to speak. It's it's very inclusive. There's a lot of other things that like want you to pay, like, you know, $5,000 to do a pitch and stuff like that. So and I'm doing it more or less as a pay it forward thing. Uh, I, I say that I'm like mining relationships to borrow the, you know, Bitcoin mining thing. I do it to mine relationships and and to just develop the network. So it's, uh, you know, anybody that's got a project, it's, it's a great place to go to get exposure. Cool. And then one last question, I'll hand the floor over to someone else. So uh, uh, before the one on one level, right? So I, I've heard the buzzwords. Uh, where do I start? Do I grab a, a subject matter expert, someone that I know, like, and trust and, and start getting direct one on one guidance? Do I buy a course, uh, feed my way through the course and get a, a fun, fundamental baseline understanding of the technical terms uh, and, and then create a wallet and, and start playing with a couple dollars, a couple cents here and there? Uh, well, what's the most practical way to get involved for someone that is is just trying to break that free fear barrier? Well, I'd say you, you probably have three paths, right? And so one of those is the kind of slog through it and figure it out on your own, which many, many crypto OGs have done. And that's how I did it. You just, so people that 
don't get stopped by that and they have no problem going in whatever nooks and crannies and going wherever they need to go to figure it out. That's one possibility. But like I always say, you're going to end up missing opportunities, making mistakes, and you don't have time to, you know, make that, you know, you don't have time to really go down that path. So, and you could, uh, you know, sign up for stuff. You could sign up for courses and things like that. As a matter of fact, one of the things we're going to do is a quick start guide that just helps you, allows you to get in the game with like a few hours, like two or three hours, quick start guy, get in the game. It's not, we don't have that yet, but that's, that's the goal. And then you just, again, you just build up from there. But like I said, I think that's one of the things that people get stopped. I still hear things like, oh, I thought that I, to get to buy Bitcoin, I had to buy one Bitcoin and stuff like that. It's like, oh no, 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 no. You can, if you five or $10 or a hundred dollars, you know, it's, there's a 100 million unit. One Bitcoin is 100 million units. So you can buy however much you want of it, but it's to get it in the, get in the game because that's, that's, that's what stops people. I think is the biggest thing. Once you do that, then you create the forward momentum. Love that. Thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for asking those amazing questions. So first, I just want to make a couple comments. One is I really don't think there's experts in these um, in these areas because it's always changing so quickly. Yes, you can be experienced. You can know a lot, but um, I don't think that there's really experts because it's changing. The laws are changing so quickly. But, you know, people like like Kirk Phillips and Jacob, they're in it. They live it. They breathe it. And so they are the trusted advisors of these industries. And I would recommend anybody listening, reach out to them, um, you know, talk to them, you know, uh, trust them. They, they're excellent uh, Web3 crypto uh, people to to discuss these topics with. And then I would like to know, you know, Kirk, you mentioned that you're a crypto OG. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> that's a, that's a great question. If you ask a bunch of different OGs, they probably they probably give you different answers. But uh, I mean, I didn't even when I first started hearing, I was like, what is that? What is that? But I think people are using the OG term, you know, in different. It's not just a crypto thing, but somehow it more from you hey, know, original gangster. OG, is OG you know. original gangster. Yeah, original gangsta like that. So it's just kind of morphed into that. And if you're an OG, you just been in something a long time, kind of like that. So I, I just, I just kind of adopted that myself. But like speaking to Michael Turpin, I think when he was at a conference, he did this thing like, "All right, everybody, stand up. All right, if you were here for the first happening, you know, or well, actually, he started what you know, he started going. If you've been in it for a couple of years, sit down or whatever. He kept doing that. But he's like, "All right, I think the definition. If you were in back in it in 2013." at the first happening or second, whatever that was, then then you're an OG in that case. I was like, well, I think I'm in that category because like I said, you know, I, I once I once I discovered this, I just it just seems like it's the right recipe for me. It just really resonates with my personality and everything. I love the technology and I love the ethos. And so I just consume it. I can't stop consuming it. So I just this is like I said, all I do is live, eat and breathe this, you know, 24 hours a day practically. So I love that. Yeah. Maybe maybe that's the definition. <laughs> okay, that, that's a great definition. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. My next question is, why are you so long on Bitcoin? Oh, that is a great question. So I've been long on Bitcoin since I'd say probably day one. And uh, I think that over a 10-year period of time, I've never seen Bitcoin as each and every day goes by. I've never looked at Bitcoin as... The, the value proposition has decreased in any way whatsoever. I always see every day I see it in slightly new different way. Every day I see it as more beautiful. Tomorrow I'm going to see it more beautiful than I did today and so on. And I see that the, it seems to me that the value proposition is always going up. I've never, never, it's never occurred to me as going down and I don't see that stopping. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's many things there. First of all, I actually did a video called the five superpowers of Bitcoin. So <laughs> I tried to spin it in a way that would be like consumable for people. But, you know, one of the superpowers is its scarcity factor. I don't think people really realize just how much of a superpower that is. So that first book that I mentioned that I wrote, like I wrote, I wrote a whole book, spent two years writing it and got back to the place like where you first began. And it's like, oh yeah, that's right. It's an, it's a basic economic principle 101, which is as simple as, um, you know, when you have a high demand and you have a low supply, there's only one thing that can happen to price. And by the way, just to be super clear, as we continue on with this, um, I borrowed this from somebody I saw with a post on Twitter a number of years ago, but price is the most, the price is the least interesting thing about Bitcoin. So just, you know, chew on that for a second. That's how, that's how it is for me. 
because a lot of people just start diving into it. Like the only thing they care about is like, how can I make as much money as possible and make as much return? And to me, it's like, I buy, I subscribe to that. That's the most least, least interesting attribute. So we do have the scarcest asset on the planet. And, um, you know, we don't have, we, we just don't have printing presses that are on 24 hours a day. Let's open another factory and make sure we have three shifts because we can never make sure that we don't, our printing presses have to be in constant motion. We can never have them be in the off position. They've always got to be on. But, you know, um, like I, said, I, could, I could go on and on about this, but it's also, I think the other thing people don't realize other than scarcity is Bitcoin is, is uh, people are still trying to wrap their heads around what is it, but it's also the immutability layer, right? Because what that means is basically we have the best example that we've ever had in human history of something that can't be changed and from a fraud examiner, you know, from auditor's perspective, accountant's perspective, et cetera. Um, when you think about all the shenanigans that goes on and altering documents and, you know, all these types of financial shenanigans and fraud and stuff like that. It's like, oh my God, this is, this is, this is amazing. This is what we've been waiting for. Something that can't be altered. I mean, this is phenomenal. So to me, that's, there's the power of, of it being infeasible to alter the Bitcoin blockchain specifically that there's no other blockchain that has a immutability proposition that the Bitcoin blockchain does. So that's just a few things right there. I just don't even think people understand that component they're they're not even, they're maybe trying to even get to the what do you mean by how is scarcity and trying to wrap their head around that and because people are like oh it's this alternate payment rail thing and stuff like that but there's so many things about it that make it like super awesome like i say i see it newly every day you know i see bitcoin in a new way every day so i've been long from the beginning i'm even long now and of course i just did a you know i just did a um uh, uh, a blog post on this where I, and I, that's why I preface it with price is the least interesting thing. Cause I, what I did is I analyzed ARK Invest, Kathy Wood, if anybody's familiar with her, she's a legend in the legacy finance space, been around for 45 years, has ARK Invest. And, and the other thing is invest, they invest in technology, not just blockchain technology, not just Bitcoin, all emerging technology, like categories I've never even heard of. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even know there was all these other amazing areas of technology. So I give them a lot of credit and others like that who have the ability to analyze stuff using it's like kind of like scientific methods for analyzing how do you value things. So that's why I give a lot of weight in that area. And so I was long, but now like it's even blew my mind away when I studied this this past week. I'm like, my mind just like exploded. And it's like, wow, it's like. So, yeah, like I said, I, I would recommend some people actually go read that because that's a great source. ARK Invest, it's called Big Ideas. Every year at the beginning of January, they put a, a, a white paper, a research paper out. It's called Big Ideas. So Big Ideas 2022, Big Ideas 2023. And in there, they break down what the basis is for how Bitcoin could. And just now seven and a half years, it was eight because that was January. Now we're in the middle of 23. So in seven and a half years, the bear case for Bitcoin is $258,000. The bull case for Bitcoin is $1.48 million. And I know you've heard these, a lot of people have seen these articles about this and could, you know, Bitcoin evangelists touting it. But when you really look at like somebody who's got, can actually come up with like a real basis for the number, then you can see it much differently. And I even think that the basis of it, even on the bull case, I'm like, look at these seven points about market penetration in these areas. I'm like, this is the conservative, conservative, conservative. There's only one of those that I thought was, I didn't agree with. So that's just, I'm trying to make it short and succinct because I could go on a while, you know, about how I'm long on Bitcoin. No, that's that's awesome. I actually read your recent article, uh, your blog post as well, and I thought 1.48 million. Wow, that's that's crazy. And then I started going through the numbers, and it makes complete sense. So thank you so much for providing those articles for our viewers and and the crypto world. It's it's so much needed. You know, what is um, what is your investment strategy and what have you learned about investing in crypto? I'll uh, I'll start with the latter piece, which is the thing I love about investing in crypto. And like I said, been doing that since the very beginning and um, the, you know, be, the beginning for me. From going back to 2014, but I, I, to, to me, I tell you what it teaches is you learn everything there is to know about uh, investing in general. I mean, you will earn some major stripes investing in crypto teaches you about everything you need to know in life as well. So, and, and it's a, it's a crash course. You will learn it. You will learn it deeply. You will learn it quickly. And it'll, it, it, it's a way to, like I said, I think earning your stripes and trying to think, you know, like cliches like that. And um, it's just, 
it's a, it's a way to get all that stuff that you're not going to get, at least in the same time period, I believe, in, in investing in other assets. And there's a number of reasons for that, because obviously, the deeper you go, you're navigating scams and hacks and fraud. It's, you know, it's, it's all new technology. We're still dealing with a lot of stuff is experimental in nature. And there's all these lots of disclosures on these apps that you're using about it being experimental. So, um, you know, that's why, um, that's why, you know, you, it just, uh, it, you, you just, you just learn really quickly from it. And if you make mistakes, hopefully you're not making big mistakes, but hopefully, you know, you make, make mistakes and you learn from it and stuff like that. So I just, I mean, overall, I would just say it really, it's, it's taught me a lot about investing and a lot about life in a short period of time. And you can grow some really, really thick skin because you can like, if you, if you, if I told people like some of the swings and some of the stuff I've been through, and I'm sure other, you know, other OGs, let's say have been through, um, some people will be like, oh man, I could never do that. I don't have the appetite for that. I'm too risk averse or whatever. But I think once you, the more you get into it, I think the 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 risk the risk becomes less and less intimidating, and it's actually easier to navigate, and 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 stuff like that. So anyway, with all that being said, um, you know, there's a lot of people that may teach courses, and there's a lot of uh, you know people that focus on uh, trading fundamentals and the technicals and stuff like that, and, and either do courses on it or they like that's their thing that they tweet about, and. Um, yeah, if you want to call it day trading and stuff like that, that's definitely not me. I, I just feel like if you get into that, then you got to go all in. You'll be completely consumed about it, by it to the point it would be like you being like a doctor or anything else where you're like on call and you're an emergency room doctor and you never have a day or an hour off. And you always got to be worried about, you know, that you're paying attention to it. Because if you don't, something could happen and you could screw, screw up your assets and things like that. So I like that might be suit some people, but for me, it doesn't. I need to be able to I need to be able to walk away and say, you know what, I'm going off for three days because I need to do whatever I need to do and, you know, go, I don't know, go on a hike wherever, you know, uh, commune with nature or whatever the case is and not and, and not have any worries about it. That's just my style. So I think that, again, it's like you have, you got to be so concerned. It's like, and then like for me, my personality is if I do something, I want to be the best at it. So if I was going to be a day trader, I would even be, I'd have to go all in and put all my energy in there. And I'd really be consumed by it. I'd be on this like hamster wheel thing. I'm not saying not do it. If it's somebody's thing, you know, absolutely go for it. But again, mine is more like figure out what you think the long-term value proposition is. And I think I'm just long in general. So my horizon on the whole blockchain and crypto space is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. I mean, it was that 10 years ago. It's like, it's still that. So since I have that, that's where people get tripped up too, is their, their time window is not wide enough. Same thing with the Bitcoin and the whole, the, well, I said the three reasons people are going to miss that upside on Bitcoin in eight years. Their window is so small that the narrative is, oh, well, Bitcoin's down from its high of 69,000 and now it's trading at 28,000. That's the narrative that bounced around. And to me, like I said, that's a rounding error in the long run. Like 69,000 is the same as 28,000 as far as I'm concerned. That's a teeny tiny rounding error because my horizon is so far out, right? So I think it helps when you're long and then you say, well, what, what else am I long on? Well, I think layer ones in general, like Bitcoin is a layer one blockchain, right? Like a foundational blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, several of the other layer ones that have emerged. So I think that several of those are going to be winners. And you can invest in something that you're long on. It's going to have long-term upside. But now we've, now we've transitioned in many of these blockchains to proof-of-stake blockchains. And they say, well, what's that mean? Well, you can, put your, uh, you can buy your, your tokens and then you can stake the tokens with that network, which adds security. So you're ac actually helping the security of the network. And then as a benefit or as a reward for doing that, you get staking rewards. So if I buy AVAX, the Avalanche blockchain, and I stake that, then I'll get avalanche rewards back so kind of like the legacy analogy would be obviously interest in dividends and stuff like that so you can you can actually get you know returns that are analogous to the things that people are familiar with in, the, in legacy finance like i said you know interest in dividends and stuff like that and you can get that in the crypto space so you can actually um you know experience the the upside on your principal right that's is your whatever your tokens are you're invested in plus you get these returns so so and it's interesting because i don't know if there's any other asset quite like this but as if your token was to say double over a one year period of time well your principal just double but now your income just double too so it's like both of those things happen simultaneously i don't know that it really exists like that anywhere so 
I'd, I'd like that. Um, you know, but then it's also like, you know, go dabble in other stuff too. Like, okay, you know what? Like, you know, there's a meme coin craze. Like there's people that just made millions of dollars on Pepe. And of course that all happened in three weeks. And I was like, what, what just happened there? Like I was on a hike. I went through the Appalachian trail when all that stuff was going on, but I missed the whole thing. I'm like, what's going on? So you can dabble, but just dabble like little bits, you know, maybe it's like hundred or a thousand there. And, you know, even a thousand bucks would have made a million dollars in, in Pepe or whatever, for example. So you can like go risky, but it should be the more minor part of the game, I think. And the bigger part of the game is better to be, you know, look for where you can go long on something that's going to really accrue value over the long term. Go ahead, Jacob. Do you want to add into that? Yeah, I have a couple points to touch on what you said um, to clarify for for the listeners from like my gaming brand, particularly. So when we're talking about proof of stake, right, if, if you're involved in legacy banking, fiat, fiat banking, you know, your Bank of America's your chase, uh, whatever, um, when you put up money in your savings account for an APY, um, you know, you're looking at two one hundredth of a percent. Uh, whereas when you're when you're in an LP or an AMM, you're on a proof of chain, a proof of stake blockchain. Uh, it's not unrealistic to see uh, multiple percents, um, which is, you know, people look at that and they go, well, this is this is unsustainable. This is crazy. But actually, it's not. Um, and it's to go back on to what you said about uh, seven minutes ago to retouch on it to people why uh, reiterating why it's so vital to pay attention to this is because to go from commodity, uh, commodity backed currency. So all these uh, governing bodies having one-to-one ratios of, of finite commodities, your, your golds, your silvers, your platinums uh, in reserve. And so all their money is, is back. It's finite. It, it means something. It's not a Federal Reserve note. It's, it's actual money that, uh, you know, it's sort of just uh, the next level of the, the uh, bargaining, uh, you know, bar, trade and barter system. Uh, and then to go off of that system, not be backed one-to-one, um, actually put in a federal position, p- uh, petition that actually passed to take all the, um, the consumer's uh, gold and then give issue out uh, a new issuance of reserve notes that is quite literally sky money. That's why fiat money is, you know, if they want a couple more trillion dollars, they just type one with a bunch of zeros behind it on a computer, click enter and bada bing, bada boom. It's, it exists. It's in circulation. And uh, I don't, you don't need to be a genius with supply and demand uh, macro and microeconomics to know that's probably not very good for your, your lower and middle-class individuals who are, are working to save uh, your, it's we, we won't go into all that, uh, but then to go into from there, uh, digital verifiable blockchains uh, where you have a, a public ledger that anyone can look into. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin, there's 21 million that will ever be mined into existence. There's not going to be 22 million. There's not going to be 24 million. And by 2040, when they're all mined, that's it. The, the, you, you'll probably see some price stabilization there, uh, which is why it's it's not unrealistic to say Bitcoin to seven figures in the long run. Like you said, having a long enough time horizon. If you're trying to scalp one week trades, you're you're not shooting for a six figure Bitcoin target in one week, right? And um, so that's why blockchain makes so much sense. It's digital verifiable money, and it's it's not uh, it's not sky money that people can. Even though people think because it's digital, you can't touch it. It's sky money. It's fake. It's it's more real than the fiat that you're you're using um, because that can just yeah. be printed into oblivion. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so to touch on, I don't remember the word you used. I, I keep thinking Murphy's law, but that's not what you said. Murphy's law is if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. But uh, something law about how, uh, oh, you know, Johnson's it can be decentralized. Law. Johnson's, yeah, Johnson's law. Johnson. Okay. Another last name. Cool. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, decentralized everything. So um, for the people that uh, are on my gaming brand, uh, I, I've only touched on uh, DeFi gaming, so blockchain gaming and the ability to uh, put a, a crypto token backed as the in-game currency so that there's actual tangible real-world financial gain uh, for the end users playing the video game. Uh, but what is decent, what's the difference between decentralized and centralized fundamentally? And, uh, and what are some examples of different industries that we could see, maybe we don't see now, but it, it, the large um, overarching issues in those industries could be potentially fixed by a blockchain adoption in that in that industry yeah that's a that's a great question so yes decentralized and centralized by the way you just said something there transparency i realized i kind of missed a whole important thing that we could cover which is the transparent aspect now not everything's going to be fully transparent but right now most public blockchains are basically transparent public public blockchains and what's that mean that means basically any participant can see what's going on essentially at any point in time and actually when frauds and hacks occur, there's these security firms that they, 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 they spotted this stuff within, you know, 
like seconds even a minute and they're, they've already tweeted it out and the community knows and it can be addressed like the average fraud the average time to detection in a fraud in the legacy sense is 18 months it's mind-blowing and that's i mean we're not talking about the ones that are never identified so there's so many the value proposition of transparency and decentralized finance is amazing so i mean basically in the old model what you have is centralized power and control that means it's a small group of people are making all the decisions Think about the good old boys, right? The good old boys in the boardroom making decisions. That's how I think about, you know, central banking. Often been criticized for lack of transparency, stuff like that. Just a few people that have control over turning dials and so on. And that affects, you know, millions of people in whatever particular country that is, or even globally like that. So now what you have is like, again, what's brilliant about Bitcoin is that it's so... Uh, widely distributed there is no one single party that has control over this thing it's like it's like amazing it's like it's like the most perfect recipe it's like that's why it's it's so beautiful to me because how can you have something that where you can actually you can have bad actors participate you can have nefarious actors participate it's transparent at the same time there's no single person that's can control but it's resilient and it works and has been working effectively for 13 straight years and you you know what uh, that it, it's going to work uh, consistently every single time, twenty four hours a day, day and night. You need to use the network. It works. So like all those things together just blows my mind. You don't have that with uh, centralized um, entities. And just think of, I just think I, I read an article earlier, right? So as a, a possible uh, fallout of the FTX exchange blow up and all the other things that happened with the three arrows capital and all these crazy blowups that happened back in 21 when the market took a dive. There was another app, maybe I won't mention the app, but it was being criticized of, you know, they're on Twitter saying, oh, no, we're not bankrupt. No, 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 we're good. We're, everything's good over here. Well, meanwhile, there's a regulator that's given them a cease and desist order and said, oh, we think you've been solvent since March the 31st. And here they are, they're touting themselves, everything's fine. So it's, it's like that kind of shenanigans that I just have zero tolerance for. And you can't get away with that. And blockchain, like your Aves of the world and your decentralized, uh, uh, your decentralized protocols and stuff, decentralized finance. And again, you got to use these things to really get what this the power of what it is. But like that stuff's transparent, so like you know what's going on. It's like that's that's what's beautiful about it because the transparency keeps people in check. And so there's a lot of shenanigans like that going on. But like I said, that was an article that I just read, and I'm thinking that just is disgusting to me that you're out there. And I understand there's probably an element of survival because. The minute we, if we let on, there was something wrong, you know, people might withdraw all their funds and it could blow up in a day. But still, it's like, that's violating your, you know, to me, it's an ethics violation. It's a moral violation. It's all that stuff. So. I got, I got a few comments, uh, qu questions. Kirk, thank you so much for all your knowledge in, in this space. Um, I have a few comments. I came from a financial advising background with the private bank for 16 years and um, I took some courses with NASDAQ uh, for continuing education. And um, one of the things that they are actually teaching and educating the financial advisors there on the street at these institutions is, you know, what is blockchain? What is crypto? Because um, I do see, and they do see, especially NASDAQ and all these institutions, is they're going to start seeing financial advisors um, locally at your bank or at your firm or institution starting to advise or um, educate clients probably within a certain level of size in the, in the beginning about digital assets on the platform. Um, so I do see that that's going to be the future. Um, so thank you for all the education that you provide because I do see this transformation that we're going through in crypto and blockchain. And it takes a lot of, you know, people like you and everyone else here to engage, to inspire and grow and educate each other about this technology. So thank you so much. Um, another comment I uh, had was um, you mentioned about transparency and coming from a banking industry, I think transparency is important because oftentimes you hear, you know, customers coming to the bank is like, hey, what's going on in my account? How do I check this? Um, what, what's going on? And it seems like, you know, centralized bank is really controlling how the money flows and how money works and how money gets reported over to you, um, where I think now it's putting the clients and the customers who own this money is their money back in the driver's seat. So I, I truly believe that transparency is important. Um, on top of the Federal Reserve, uh, I think Jake, you talked about you know the you know the printing press. I think Kirk, you talked about the printing press. 
being money printed, you know, insanely in the economy, increasing the money supply in the economy and creating inflation. I think that's one of the things that um, this technology will have a control over is the, because there's only 21 million uh, coins that's going to be available. We know that regulations is 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 in an, in the horizon, right? So I guess the question would be, um, when the government and Fed steps in, which they are stepping in and try to, you know, um, you know, enter in into some sort of regulation of into the framework of financial institution, because banks don't like, it, right? Banks don't like, you know, the, the people that are J.P. Morgan's, the Chase, the Wells Fargo. They don't like this technology to take over the banker role, right? Because the banker role is only, you know, a boardroom of uh, people that makes decision on how money flows. It's, it's kind of like the 2008 debacle. The feds call in all the bankers in Wall Street, sat them down and say, what's going on with this real estate catastrophe and, and, and this meltdown, okay? So you know that the money is only controlled by those people in the boardroom. So, um, so I feel like this is gonna be a big change, but how do you feel about when regulations and when bankers come in, you know, and Wall Street bankers come in, like, what are your thoughts about how, how that framework would look like and, and um, how, how, how would it affect the overall? ecosystem is what i'm trying to say yeah so regulation emerging regulation and so forth that, that reminds me that uh self-custody is something we should touch on if we can i know we're maybe have a little bit of time left but forgot there you go actually forgot that's one of the key elements i was like how could i forget about self-custody but as far as regulation goes uh banks and so forth um i mean there's no doubt to me that any all of this stuff is a major major threat to um the all of the financial system all of the large banks and all the other financial institutions and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's kind of like the old saying, uh, I don't know if it was Rothschild or, you know, I think that's where it came from, but he, who, he who owns the gold makes all the rules. So if you, so right now the central banks essentially metaphorically own the gold, they own that, you know, their, their system. So because they control that, that means they control all the rules. So control controlling money equals controlling the rules and how people operate. So that's, I mean, that's the thing you're going to fight for your life, giving that one up more than anything else that's out there, right? You don't want to give that up because if you give that up, you also, you're just simultaneously giving up, um, you know, controlling everything. Every every framework that people operate under, you're controlling everything when you control the money. So, um, but I think what's happening now is that um, I think there's so much VC capital in it and there's so much other capital we don't know of, even your, you know, Jamie Dimon Jamie Dimon say, I'm going to fire any of my employees and invest in Bitcoin. And meanwhile, they're secretly accumulating Bitcoin. And I think even even the even the central banks are actually going to end up uh, filling their coffers and their reserves with Bitcoin and ETH and but certainly Bitcoin stuff like that. So I think there's too much money in the game now from a whole bunch of players that even though it seems like, especially in the U.S., the SEC is like trying to like eliminate all the oxygen so that the fire goes out. Um, I still think there's just too many people from too many different types of stakeholders that are in, invested in the game. I just think it's it's got too much momentum in that sense for this to be squelched. It's just a matter of, you know, maybe how yeah, it's not going to it's not the flame's not going to go out entirely. But how unfriendly are the regular the regulations going to be in the long term? Um, I'm just shocked that the SEC I mean like I said we could have a whole thing on that I just it just my mind blows apart when I think about that but um I mean to be thinking about like especially from the US having the dominant world world reserve currency like it's in their interest they don't want to give that up either they want to they want to maintain their dominance and so to not embrace this technology and really work in a symbiotic way with the innovators um many people have said and people are just going to you know go up go off to another country somewhere and innovate over there and so everybody's getting pushed out and so you could be literally giving up your this is a key point in time here where you could be giving up your dominance by not working with the people collectively you know especially in this country so i think that uh you know there's a lot of other countries that are that are rather friendly you know uh, even uh, Liechtenstein is one of the ones the most friendly country that created it they scrapped all their regulations and said, you know what, this, this technology is so amazing. We're going to start from the ground up because what we got is, is doesn't fit. Let's just start from a blank piece of paper and create regular. Now that's, that's how you go about doing it, right? Creating something like that. We got that on one end of the spectrum. And then we got like the SEC on the other end of the spectrum. So I'll just leave it at that. 
I have a lot of things to touch on um, all over the board, sort of. Um, when we're talking about uh, going back to bad actors, right? Um, in Web2, um, there's, you know, uh, maybe perhaps a bad example or maybe perhaps a good example. I'll, I'll, I'll censor the words a little bit, but we've got a... Uh, We've got some situations going on that are only now resolving from uh, from early 2020 with uh, involving CP and, uh, you know, Epstein and stuff like that. And uh, in Web 2, right, you can, uh, you know, JP Morgan just settled out uh, for $280 million. Uh, and then they can go ahead and, and wipe that off the slate. Boom, bada bing, bada boom. Nobody t- hears about it, talks about it. It's it's swept under the rug completely. Uh, in Web 3 with bad actors, that's that's not going to happen, right? There's a lot of people that have been uh, rug- professional ruggers. And for people that don't understand uh, uh, the term rug uh, means to launch a project, which if you think of about an NFT project as a, a company, you launch a project, uh, you gather uh, all these mints. So your project mints out, which is effectively the same thing as uh, uh, crowdfunding, um, sort of like, uh, um, I don't remember what the platform's called, um, but basically crowdfund. And then all of a sudden you, uh, you, you're you an uh, anonymous alias, you disappear, you take the money and run, you move to the Bahamas and start a slush fund where you, never mind. You know, but uh, that that's, you only, you only get one reputation. And because it's open source, it's a public distri- distributed ledger, Anyone can do their research on any particular individual with not that much knowledge uh, and, and go down the rabbit hole of what transactions is this person involved in, what honeypots are their hands dipped into. And you can determine based on your own level of self-understanding, which, like I said, it doesn't require uh, you don't need to be a, a proficient subject matter expert or a master of this stuff to understand how to do this. And you can go, wow, this person has been uh, this person's wallet has been attached to the heads of several projects that have been multiple million dollar rugs. And uh, I, I don't think I want to come anywhere close to this person, uh, which is it's great. Right. So it fixes the uh, the transparency layer. Uh, another thing about centralized control, I mean, I'm, I don't want to talk bad about any governments, but the CCP has already launched a, a test phase of this. And it's sort of George Orwellian 1984, right? You get a social credit score system in place. You get the digital yuan or the digital version of whatever fi- uh, finite centralized currency they have. And then all of a sudden, uh, if you're a good little boy, you get your uh, monthly stipend that you're allowed to spend on bread or eggs, but you can't buy your kid uh, a floaty pool or whatever it is um, because you're not allowed to use it for that. And then in 30 to 60 or 90 day periods, uh, your programmable money is gone, goes poof, because it's still, although it's on a blockchain, it's not a public sector blockchain. It's not decentralized. It's fully centralized, It's fully programmable, and they can get rid of the ability to build generational wealth which is why self-custody is important, which we touched on briefly. Um, this is a, a seed phrase, which attra- attaches to my decentralized wallet, which attaches to this thing that looks kind of like a flash drive, but it's actually a bank that I hold sole control of under three-factor authentication. So my money's not moving unless I do it and I know about it. Um, so I, I own my own bank instead of trusting my money to a uh, large conglomerate that's going to go uh, fractional reserve, lend all my money out, make a, a bunch of money, 15, 30%. And APRs and then pay me two one hundredth of a percent per year. And then inflation is actually stealing more than 7% of my money every year, but I'm too uneducated to know that. Um, and uh, we talked about uh, SBF and uh, FTX, um, which for the people that don't understand what that was, um, it's sort of just a uh, faulty characters not doing their own due diligence and not having proper uh, structure set up. They had a slush fund with a uh, Alameda Research, which was a uh, VC uh, firm. Uh, and they had a uh, FTX, which was a currency exchange. So where users could download the app and store their cryptocurrency and buy, sell and trade crypto. Um, but what was happening on the back end, um, you know, in normal Web2, which makes a lot of sense, you have your separate CFOs, CEOs, CMOs, you have your VP of sales, you have separate departments and you have separate figureheads, separate individuals in place of leadership. Uh, whereas in this situation, they had pe- people are, are sharing similar roles across the board on multiple different organizations. They had one gigantic slush fund of money and they were uh, investing in their own uh, uh, ERC-20, so their own cryptocurrency that they created to artificially prop up the money, make it seem like it's mo- more viable than it was. Uh, and, and again, with the whole transparency layer, 
someone does the research who also happened to be one of their primary competitors, CZ, uh, with Binance, which, uh, you know, we, we, we won't talk about market manipulation or what all that is. You touched on uh, meme coins and, you know, Elon can tweet about Doge and have a 30% spike in 24 hours. And he gets a little slap on the wrist from the SEC, a $10 million fine. Meanwhile, he, he made way more than $10 million. We won't talk about that. Uh, but we had a slush fund going on. And then when people used the open public ledger to go, okay, something's not right. Why is this wallet attributed to Alameda holding uh, several billions of dollars of their token, FTT token? Uh, and then all of a sudden we see in a 24 hour period, the token drops 85%. Uh, all the money's gone. It's it's dried up. We're, we've got a $12 billion hole in the in the uh, the books. And, and now it's over. You're, you're insolvent. And now we got big problems. And now the SEC steps in, but it's too late. And to share on the whole SEC steps in, um, we've got, I, I don't want to talk bad about these people because I'm sure they've meant well for their their years in, in the political sphere, but we have geriatric uh, uh, fossils running this country that, I mean, I, I don't know if any, I, I'm a social influencer, so I pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the uh, the decentralized social media endeavors, as well as Web2 platforms. And uh, I watched the large majority of the TikTok hearing, the congressional hearing with uh, with Congress. And we, we've got questions being asked to uh, the CEO of TikTok, like, does TikTok use Wi-Fi? So we've got people that, that don't even understand how the internet works, Web2, uh, trying to figure out what, what are we going to do about this whole decentralized platform? And it's just so they, they don't have a shmi like, like Kirk, like me, like Crystal, like any of us, uh, you know, in their ear advising for them, explaining to them what all this means. So they are, they're shooting from the hip, not knowing what's going on. Um, so you're really, I mean, as far as regulation goes, in my personal opinion, I, I think we're a far ways out from seeing anything that has any, bears any merit. I don't think we're far ways out from from seeing a, uh, a UBI, universal basic income, and uh, and sort of launching, uh, you know, Fed now coin, um, having a centralized currency that is a, a digital currency backed and and attributed to a social credit score system, which if you haven't read 1984 by George Orwell, Give it a read, and, and uh, if that horrifies you, you should stand up and, and assert your rights as a as a U.S. citizen. Um, yeah. But well yeah, said. so that's so, my uh, that that's the that's yeah. the notes that I had. That's everything I wanted to touch on. Oh, okay, but. well that's that's well said. I, I think I think we running uh, uh, running short on some time here, but just the one key thing I wanted to put in tack on your thing about the self custody is a great great point there. And uh, by the way, speaking of uh, you know. 1984 if any there's any black mirror fans out there that show is like incredible like 75 percent of those episodes are just like mind-blowing sci-fi but there's one on social credit scoring where you actually have a hologram that's like next to your head that's visible as you walk around and just check that episode out that'll tell you what the future is going to look like but anyway self-custody the value proposition of crypto one of the reasons i love it is because you're talking about the beautiful balanced ecosystem of the bitcoin blockchain well one of the other things is that you actually control your own assets so at least like we basically lived in a one choice world and legacy finance and banking, which is you either put your money in a bank or I mean, you could put it under your mattress, but let's say that's not even an option. Right. So you lived in a one choice world. Now we have a multi choice world, which is great. You can choose to either if you want to go back and say, well, you know what, I, I'm just going to, you know, not self custody my assets, which is basically have my crypto. It's with the equivalent of a bank. Right. If that's where you're comfortable, that's fine. But you can. But. Somebody who doesn't want to choose that, I can choose to self-custody. We can all choose to self-custody here, right? And put it in a hardware wallet like Jacob showed there. So to me, that's like, this is what we've all been waiting for. Why? Like, now this is not for everybody, but it is for me. It's like, I've been waiting for, now I can control my own assets. I'm 100% responsible for my own assets. Like, why wouldn't you want that? But that's just me. And I know it's only some people, but the, again, the beautiful part is you don't have to do that. You can choose. So there's a lot of choice. But in the sense that, you know, because when you basically put your assets into the bank, the bank really owning the assets at that point, you've given up that control. And so, you know, 2008, all you got to do is say that one word, you know, great financial recession, great global recession. Um, and so, you know, basically being able to control your own assets is, is a huge thing. And like you said, unless, you know, unless you screw up, I mean, you can screw up your security, but, you know, unless you send it, it's not going anywhere. It's up to you to be responsible for what happens with your assets. Excellent comments, you guys. Thank you again so much, Kirk, for being here. Jacob, thank you for 
being our guest co-host. We appreciate you so very much. And we learned so much from all of you. Um, Alan, would you mind wrapping up in prayer? And then if everybody would mind staying on so that we can do some introductions and get to know who else has popped in here, um, that would be fantastic. All right, I'll close in prayer and we'll do some introductions. Um, Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, thank you so much for another week of Critical Canvas Show that we can um, glorify you by getting you know, um, like-minded individuals to help each other inspire, grow, and educate each other about, um, you know, what we believe in and what we uh, think that it will be in the future, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for putting all these people together in your midst. Uh, we know that when there's two or three people that's gathered together, you're in our midst. And you know that um, through all things, as long as we continue to keep God um, in first and uh, in the focus, Lord, you will help us. You will get us into um, um places that you, you never would imagine, Lord. So, Lord, continue to bless this group, continue to protect, and um, want to celebrate all the fathers that are out there this weekend. May you um, and protect the time uh, with the family, uh, with the friends. Um, Lord, uh, thank you so much for everything. Uh, we love you. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen.